Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming to today's event at Japan of London. Tonight, we are delighted to present the screening of the documentary Tokyo Paralympics Festival of Love and Glory with an introduction by Dr. Jan Britten, um, whose presentation is also being live streamed on Japan of London's Facebook, YouTube, YouTube and LinkedIn. This film was um, recently restored after being rediscovered in the archives of Kadokawa Corporation and is being directed by Watanabe Kimio, who was mostly famous for his work as a cinematographer. The film is an intimate account of the Tokyo Paralympic Games of 1964 and it allows insight into the journey of the Japanese athletes whose participation helped raise disability awareness in Japan. The event is held in conjunction with our current exhibition, Tokyo 1964 Designing Tomorrow, which is on display in the gallery here at Japan of London until the 7th of November. And on the ground floor, you can also find a display of uh, the interdisciplinary work of Tokolo Asao, who is the designer of the emblems for the Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games. And we will be also holding um, Nurie workshops inspired by his work uh, this weekend here at Japan House, where participants uh, can color in pattern worksheet created specially for Japan of London by Tokolo Asao himself. Um, we also have another screening for those of you who might be interested uh, of Tokyo Olympiad by Ichikawa Kon uh, on the 2 uh, of October at 15. Uh, there are also many events uh, uh, up on the website and more coming in the next few weeks, so do keep an eye on it and our social media channels. Uh, now let me introduce our speaker for tonight. Uh, Dr. Ian Britton is an Associate Professor of Research in the Center for Business and Society at Coventry University. Uh, he kindly loaned the uh, Paralympics poster that you can see in our exhibition and he has an extensive collection of memorabilia from 1964 that you can see here and that you can also uh, take a closer look at after the screening is finished. He is an internationally recognized expert in the study of disability and Paralympic sport and has attended the last five summer Paralympic Games in Sydney, Athens, Beijing, London and Rio. He specializes in um, sociological and historical aspects of disability and Paralympic sport with a particular interest in the history of the Paralympic and Stockmandeville Games and social legacies of the Paralympic Games for disabled people living in the host city. So please uh, welcome uh, to our speakers, Ian Britton. <laughs> Thank you, Federica. Um, welcome. Uh, let's get this the right way around. So, before the film screening, what I'm hoping to do is just give you a brief introduction to the games from Tokyo, um, and I'll end with a brief description of their impact and how they um, continued in the recent games that ended a couple of uh, weeks ago in Tokyo. So, in terms of Tokyo, Tokyo 64 was actually the second Paralympic Games and at that time there was actually no selection process for the Paralympic Games. Basically what would happen is the IOC would decide where the Olympics were going and then the organising committee for the Paralympic Games would go and knock on their door and say, excuse me, would you also please hold our Games? Um, not quite how it happened with Tokyo, but that's how it continued right the way up until the early 2000s. Um, so the first games were in Rome and the games committee, the Stoke Mandeville Games Committee, were keen to continue this association with the Olympic host city. Um, and they were fortunate that in uh, Rome was uh, Mrs. Hanako Watanabe and she was very taken by the games in Rome and returned to Tokyo and sort of spread the word. And the next year, Dr. Yutaka Nakamura, who was an orthopedic surgeon from Beppu, um, spent three months studying under Dr. Gutman at Stoke Mandeville. Now, just in case any of you aren't aware, Dr. Ludwig Gutman was a, a German neuroscientist who escaped Nazi Germany in 1939 came uh, and settled in Great Britain and in 1942 was asked by the British government to set up a spinal unit at Stoke Mandeville Hospital about 30 miles north of London um, and he did this and he introduced sport as one of the rehabilitation techniques 
that became an annual games called the International Stoke Mandeville Games, or started off as Stoke Mandeville and became international in 1952. Um, and in 1960, those games moved away from Stoke Mandeville for the very first time to Rome, and they are now what we call the Paralympic Games. Uh, and he would regularly have uh, medical personnel come to Stoke Mandeville, train under him, but he wouldn't just train them in the medical neuroscience techniques, he would introduce them to sport as rehabilitation. They would take that to their home country, and quite often the next year would bring a team back to Stoke Mandeville to compete in the games. And that's exactly what happened with uh, Dr. Nakamura. In 1962, he bought the first Japanese team of two athletes, Ito Takumi and Katsuya Yoshida, to Stoke Mandeville to take part in the games. And they were accompanied by Dr. Nakamura uh, and Mr. Yoshisuke Kasai, who actually was the... Um, I don't know what you'd call him, I guess the chief executive of the um, Tokyo 64 Paralympic Games. The I think he was actually the chairman. Um, and in 1964, Dr. Gutman, his right-hand person, John Scruton, and Charlie Atkinson, who was in charge of all the sports at Stoke Mandeville, flew to Tokyo to carry out site visits to prepare for the Games, which occurred in November that year. So, some of the differences from Rome, well, it had the same number of nations. There was only 21 in Rome and 21 in uh, Tokyo. There were five replacements, if you like. Part of the reason for that was actually where the games were situated. So, the new countries that took part in 1964 were based a lot closer to Japan, and therefore it was easier for them to get there. Um, for various bureaucratic reasons, it actually had to be crammed into four and a half days, including the ceremonies. Now, in Rome, it was eight days long, um, and that led to a decision by the organising committee of the Games that, in future, no Games would be less than seven days in length, because they just found trying to pack everything into four days was, was a nightmare. Um, Weightlifting was added as a sport, plus 27 extra events, including discus, um, and 47 more athletes competed in Tokyo than did in Rome. It also introduced the first rudimentary athlete accreditation card, which I've actually got here. That was the card all the athletes were given. Um, bit different, that's Tokyo 2020 you know, barcodes, all sorts of things. This one was very, very rudimentary, but it was actually the first one ever at a Paralympic Games. Um, interestingly, the Games were also, both the Olympics and the Paralympics, were sponsored by a cigarette company. Not sure that would happen today, but uh, that was the Paralympic cigarette packet. There was actually, I think, nearly 30 for the Olympic Games, because each one had a different sport. Uh, as a logo on the front. Okay, so the use of the term Paralympic. Now, perhaps I ought to add a little bit of context here. This all started in the 1949, I guess, because Gutman was constantly making connections between the Stoke Mandeville Games and the Olympic Games as a way of sort of inspiring uh, the athletes taking part. Um, I don't know if he was a madman or a visionary, but in 1949 there were two sports and 39 athletes at the Games in Stoke Mandeville. And at the closing ceremony he said, I hope one day that there will be a disabled person's equivalent of a, the Olympic Games. Hell of a thing to say when you've only got two sports and 37 athletes there, but he's been proved right. Um, so, in 1952, I think, was the very first use of the term Paralympic. And, it, and what it was, was the Games at Stoke Mandeville and the Paralympic Games right the way up to 1976 were only for wheelchair athletes and mainly paraplegics. 
And so it was a contraction of this connection to the Olympic Games and paraplegic. So it was paraplegic Olympics, but much easier just to say Paralympics. And that's how the word came about. Um, now, obviously, when we came to 1976, they actually added new um, impairment groups, such as in, uh, amputees and blind and visually impaired. Paraplegic Olympics doesn't work anymore. However, it still sounds good. So now it actually means parallel or running alongside the Olympics. So it's parallel Olympics. So we could keep the same word. Now in Tokyo, <laughs> they actually had three different titles for the games. So they had the International Stoke Mandeville Games. I think they were the 13th International Stoke Mandeville Games. And that was Gutman's preferred option because he wanted to keep the word Stoke Mandeville on people's minds, uh, keep that connection to Stoke Mandeville. They were also called the Tokyo Games for the Physically Handicapped. Um, but the organising committee also liked this word Paralympics. So they actually produced three sets of materials for the Games with, all, with three different titles on them. Um, okay. One of the things they also did was get all of the local community to um, put together, make uh, strings of paper cranes. And they literally had thousands of these. And when the athletes arrived at Haneda Airport, every one of them had one of these put around their neck um, to represent peace and long life. Um, now, believe it or not, one still exists. That's it. It's the only one I've ever seen. Um, you can imagine they're quite fragile. Most of them probably got thrown away after the Games. I was very lucky that an athlete who was at the Games in 1964 gave me this one for my collection. So, in terms of competing nations, as I say, 21, you can see, see them there, very varying in team sizes. You know, the big countries, Great Britain, United States, Japan as the hosts, but most teams, less than 10 athletes. And if you look particularly at the, the male-female split, you know, relatively very few women athletes. Now, obviously, we have to put this into its historical context. It's 1964. Um, plus, you know, particularly at that time, women weren't encouraged to take part in sports, especially if you're disabled. Um, and so that number now is, is, is slowly creeping towards parity. So we're almost at the 50-50 split for Tokyo, uh, 2020, that is. Um, in terms of the sports in Tokyo, uh, there were 10 sports in total, archery, athletics, snooker, table tennis, swimming, weightlifting, wheelchair basketball, wheelchair fencing, darchery and pentathlon. The pentathlon was a mixture of archery, athletics and swimming events and they, depending on what time or distance they scored or what they scored in the archery, they were given points and the one with the most points at the end would win. Darchery is quite an interesting one. It actually started as a means of reintegration. So um, the, uh, it, it's actually a contraction of archery darts. And what would happen is the um, paraplegics at Stoke Mandeville would shoot at a, um, a dartboard on, on an archery boss that was three times the size of a normal dartboard, and they would shoot from 30 feet with bow and arrow, and they would play against non-disabled teams of darts players, proper darts players. And uh, I think in the first seven competitions, the archers only lost once. So they beat the darts players, six, uh, I think there was a one draw, and five wins out of seven. Um, just some of the basic games overview. You can see the logo for the games with the Dove of Peace. 
and the five interlocking wheelchair wheels, supposed to represent the five continents in a V shape for victory. Uh, we've got uh, the crown prince, um, Akihito, and his wife, Princess Michiko, who actually opened the games in 1964. Uh, and this is actually a Japanese swimmer, Shigeo Aono, who actually gave the athletes oath at the opening ceremony. So these are some of the games venues. Um, obviously, that's quite a stylized uh, map. I think. As far as I'm aware, from what I remember, the main road now runs like this, and then there's a, an offshoot past the athletics track here. All of this is gone. This used to be a US military base, and it was used as the village for both the Olympics and the Paralympics. It's now all gone, and it's Yoyogi Park, um, etc. cetera. Uh, not all of the facilities were the same as the Olympics, only uh, the National Gymnasium and the Annex were used for the Paralympics. Uh, the rest of the Olympic venues weren't used. The swimming pool was actually being converted into an ice skating rink at the time the Paralympics occurred, so they actually went to uh, an, another local swimming baths for the swimming competitions. Um, not, obviously, you know, this, this was 1964, it was a US military base, so it wasn't particularly accessible, and they had three days to make it accessible for all the wheelchair athletes. So you can see they basically just used scaffolding frames and uh, sort of wooden planks, uh, and they had to do that right the way across the whole of the village. The medals for the games, there was a total of 610 medals, and they were made at Stoke Mandeville by George Butler, who was the engineering instructor in occupational therapy department, um, with the help of patients who cut the metals from bar, the medals from bars of brass and polished them, and then Mr. Butler would engrave each medal, including the symbol of the relevant sport that it was being awarded for. Um, he obviously didn't get it right every single time because that is correct for the front. You probably can't see this very well, but where the sports logo should have gone on this medal has been completely removed and the word souvenir has been etched into it. So he obviously did make mistakes when he was making these medals. In terms of the final medal table in Tokyo, well, obviously, as you can see, it was dominated by the team from the United States. The United States dominated the Summer Paralympic Games medals table right up into, I would say, the sort of mid-80s, something like that. Um, in terms of J Japanese medals, they actually won one gold medal in the Table Tennis Doubles Class C, which was uh, Yoshinori Ikari and Fujio Watanabe. They won five silver medals in archery, swimming, table tennis, and wheelchair fencing, and four bronze medals in archery, swimming, and table tennis. And they finished 13th out of 21 nations. Not actually part of the Paralympic Games, but interesting nonetheless. I mean, what was happening at the time the Paralympics were growing was that sports for other impairment groups were also starting to be organised. So after the Games finished in uh, Tokyo, this is the Paralympic Games for the wheelchair athletes, there was another sports competition um, held on for over two days on the 13th and 14th for amputees, blind and visually impaired, and deaf athletes. Um, deaf athletes have never actually competed as an official group at the Paralympic Games, although they were actually briefly part of the Paralympic movement in the 1980s. One of the reasons was there's a limit on uh, the number of athletes that could take part at a Paralympic Games, and 
the Deaf Olympics, as they're now called, already had as many athletes at their games as all of the other impairment groups together at the Paralympic Games, and they didn't want to limit the number of deaf athletes who could participate, so they decided to go their own way and keep their own games. And it's also, I guess, worth noting that some deaf people don't actually consider themselves disabled, they actually consider themselves to be a linguistic minority. So, in terms of the impact of the 64 games on the Japanese society, well, first and foremost, it led to the setting up of the Japanese Sports Association for the Disabled. Um, so it was the first time that they had an organisation that was organising sport. And, and from then onwards, there was actually a, sort of a Japanese disabled games every year after 1964. So sport started to become a regular thing. Um, they also found that it, for the Japanese, it, they felt it highlighted the differences between Japanese and foreign rehabilitation methods. And they felt that this, that the, the foreign rehabilitation methods were much more active, much more physically based. Um, and they found this quite interesting and, and sort of started to incorporate it into their own uh, rehabilitation methods. It also led to the setting up of Japan Sun Industries. Um, so these were factories where uh, all of the workers were paraplegics at the time. I think it's broadened out into other impairment groups now. But at the time, they set up factories. I think the first one was on Lake Shigain near Nagano. Um, and this was to provide employment opportunities for uh, paraplegics in, in Japan. And as of the 1st of May 2020, there were eight of these factories and they're co-funded with private companies such as Honda and Sony, etc. Um, and as the, of the same date, they actually employed 538 disabled staff members. So that is a, uh, a legacy, if you like, of the 1964 Paralympic Games. Continuing on today, there's still problems in Japan, as there is in every country in the world. Um, from my own perspective, I, prior to the pandemic, I spent about five years traveling backwards and forwards to Tokyo, interviewing um, Japanese disabled people, etc. And it was quite clear that there was a real focus on this barrier-free idea. Um, but the, the problem is, you know, that you can remove a barrier, a physical barrier, but it can still remain a barrier if you don't change attitudes towards disability. Now, a simple example of that in the UK would be a disabled parking spot in a supermarket. And yet, how many people who are non-disabled will rock up and park in those spaces just because it's easier to get, you know, and it's short to walk into the supermarket itself. Some of the examples some of the Japanese gave me, well, the metro stations have all been, con you know, those with more than 3,000 users a day have been supposedly made accessible with the introduction of lifts. Now, there's several problems with this. Quite often, non-disabled people rock up, they go, oh, a lift, I don't have to go down the escalators anymore, I can just, you know, go straight down the lift. And so they're making people in wheelchairs wait. Because the other thing about Japanese lifts is they're all quite small, so you only get a few people in there at a time. Another problem, the lifts are sited inside department stores that are next to metro stations. But the metro station might open at 6 o'clock in the morning. The department store doesn't open until 10 o'clock. And therefore, they still can't get down onto the metro platform until 10 o'clock, which is sort of, you know, there is an attitude or an understanding problem. There's an assumption there that people with disabilities don't need to go to work, etc. Um, so, removing physical barriers without changing attitudes or understanding towards disability amongst non-disabled society 
often means that those barriers just remain as barriers. There are other things, you know, things like Japanese language, the word kenjosha, meaning fully healthy. Well, there's an implicit understanding there then, or a, or a belief that anybody who isn't fully, uh, who is disabled, isn't healthy. Now, health and disability, or health and impairment, are actually two very, very different things. You know, you can be an amputee, a double leg amputee, and still be fully healthy. And those kind of things, they, they seem like quite small things, but they actually perpetuate certain stereotypes within society that obviously needs to be removed. I think that's it. I hope you enjoy the film. Thank you very much.